thanks everybody. Um, my slide is called, I thought we had more time. Uh, the, the infrastructure and buildings working group and what I've done is just introduced myself in our Mayan Tlacampan language, uh, thank the creator for the, the gift of life and the power of choice, and thanking, of course, Chad and Dan and all of you for exercising your power of choice by being here with us today. So the first slide I have here is the Tlacampan Nation. Uh, for those people who uh, speak French, we were known as the Couteau tribe since 1808. Uh, we became known as the Thompson Indians for quite a while. And in about the early 80s, we retook back our traditional uh, nation name, Nintlikampu, which translates roughly as the people who live within the Red Polygon area. We, uh, and then the map here, I've shown the towns of Lytton and Merritt, and you'll know a little bit about them because obviously the catastrophic events uh, caused by the, the heat and the atmospheric river, these are two focal points. Kanakabar, located 14 kilometers or 18 kilometers to the south of Lytton, has an area of discrete uh, and inherent jurisdiction. It is within the Purple Polygon area that our community, one of 15 communities that make up the nation, we have the inherent title and rights. So we decide what goes on within the Purple Polygon area, because that's a direct impact, but we do have a say in indirect impacts that occur outside of our area. So welcome everybody. So for the Klaklekton Mu, uh, we've managed the land and resources for 8,000 years. Okay, there's a slide deck here. I'll try to get that out of the way. And the, the principles of land and resource management for 8,000 years was that you manage the land and resources for future generations. We were stewards. We were allowed to, to live off the largesse of both the land and resources. Land is known as Tumu, but the resources were known as in Wabatan. And the, so when, when people proposed to hunt, fish, gather, live, or whatever, you had to ask, and there was uh, four simple things that we would say. So in the history of Kanakabar, we've only said no twice. First of all was uh, that time in 1858 where we fought a protracted war against American gold miners. And uh, that ended on August 23rd with the declaration of the mainland colony of British Columbia. And then the second time was more recently. And so when Kanakabar spent approximately six years studying the TMX expansion project, and we gave a free prior informed no. So regardless of Article 32.2 of DRIPA, we're still getting the pipeline. So there's still a lot of issues that are out there. For those people who want to know why we said no to the pipeline, think about the asks above. Think about the lens of climate change. TMX poses an unnecessary and unreasonable risk to the ecosystems that sustain our community. And TMX and the tripling of fossil fuel expansion or uh, uh, exports to a, a world market is inconsistent with a, a global existential crisis. So that's two reasons why we said no. There's four. Enjoy the link to uh, the video. Okay, let's see. Next. So um, Chad introduced the, the CRP. So the CRP is so we've evolved from, in 2015, a land use plan uh, where we studied all the impacts from 1808 to up to 2015, and we came up with a mission statement as part of the land use plan. It says, can Akbar wish to become a self-sufficient, sustainable environment community again? We had lived for 8,000 years uh, very well. We had this 150-year hiccup. This is BC's 150th year since the, uh, we became a province. And now we're facing a global existential crisis. So we've completely changed our, our lens. We look at everything through a climate change lens. Will this exacerbate climate change? Is this harm reduction? Is this harm reversal? Is, is this going to create uh, a, a foundations of life? Or will this remove foundations of life from my children and grandchildren? So the concept of a climate change lens is everything we say or do today is now examined for the future generations. So the climate uh, cycle that as you've heard uh, here, so at Kanaka's base, air, water, food, shelter, energy, communications, transportation, and waste. Now Chad mentioned the concept of storage, but that's underwater. So we doubled our water system storage capacity uh, in the last uh, six months. So we look at the concept of Kanaka's resiliency initiatives. So we're 
water in the fall, no water in 8,000 years. What you do to the land is an impact. And impacts produce cumulative effects. Cumulative effects is producing global warming and global warming is producing the extreme weather events. So the choice that we're all facing, and we've known this for a long time, is that we can invest in our tomorrow today or we can be in full-blown reactive slash response mode. And I can tell you, living with the, the Litton fire and the atmospheric river, it's not fun on the top of this. I'm still optimistic, I'm still happy, I'm still in the bottom, but there's times when it's overwhelming because that's what reactive and response mode does. So we we're faced now, as we've been faced now since basically 1988 and 1992 with a choice, change our impacts, change the cycle. If we do, we will have a quality of life and an environment and economy tomorrow. If we don't, I can't forecast necessarily what is coming. For those people who want to see the worst case scenarios, you know, I would certainly consider getting, a, a, I believe, a David Wallace Wells had a book uh, called, uh, I can't remember, from Inhospitable to Inhabitable. So there's certainly a lot of doomsday books out there that talks about the end result of not doing the right thing. So I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to find that material. Um, so having introduced really quickly what Kanak War is doing then, so everything we do is written down every six months in a winter plan. So please have a look if you want to have a look at Kanakabar's winter plans. I believe in our winter plan, we have 78 resiliency initiatives that are underway. And that's what takes up my time at the community. Um, so the winter plan over here, you have a look at it. Uh, we'll be starting to rewrite it for the next summer. But what it does is it highlights for the community what we're working on over the next six months. And it ends with a six month report back and a six month report forward. And we the winter plan is based on the, the CRP. Now, that it, where's the CRP? Right there. Uh, what happens is the winter plan is based on the CRP. The membership gave us seven areas that we wanted, that they wanted us to advance, the commute to create the, the, the self-sufficient sustainable environment community. That's what as leadership we're doing. And this is the end result. So here I've given a quick summary of some of the stuff. We, we, we collect site-specific data. Climate change's uh, impacts and the extreme weather events is very localized to a region. Canada's hotspot is going to get hotter. That may not be the case for Alberta and or Manitoba, as an example. But we do know that Manitoba experienced a drought this summer. So site-specific data is critical to a climate change adaption strategy, transition adaption strategy. So we've invested in a lot of uh, site-specific data collection. We know that ecosystem shifts and potentially even ecosystem collapses are on the event horizon. So we've invested heavily in growing our own meats, fruits, and vegetables. And coming soon, um, we uh, so right in the middle there, you'll see this flat space. Um, of this image, we are pointing in aquaculture and aquaponics, where we'll be raising our own salmon species in tubs and using the above ground to produce meats, fruits, our, our fruits and vegetables. So this will be coming, a uh, report will be coming out by the end of March, saying this is what we're doing, this is how much it's going to cost, and this is the schedule. I can tell you that the, the initial estimates is for $300,000, we can set up two tanks. And for $50,000, you can expand it as the need arises. So I'm, I'll leave it here other than saying everything that Connect Bar is doing is online. Please take the opportunity to review and, you know, as you need it. But the one thing I wanted to highlight is this is proactive, it's scalable, and it's replicable. So what Connect Bar is doing in terms of resiliency can be repeated anywhere in BC and in Canada. But what it does require is a change in priorities by the leadership, the families, the municipalities, the regional district, the province, or Canada. Resiliency can be built into our future, but you need to do it today. So um, one of the things that we are advancing is, this is the big one, um, so we're calling this, so we shared a document uh, at the time Minister McKenna was looking for uh, uh, shovel ready, shovel worthy projects. So we put this onto the line, said, well, here are projects in the region that benefit the entire region. The resources that we all struggle with, people, time, technology, and money. Well, Kanaka Bar has some, so we chip away at our project. So in 2020, we tore down the old restaurant lands and buildings. 
And then in 2021, we're continuing to advance in tariffs so that we could actually start building the first of its kind Highway 1 Resiliency Center. And we'll get into that a bit more, but uh, if you want, you can have a look at this document, uh, it's there. So these are big resiliency projects, not just the ones that benefit Kanaka Bar's residents, but these projects will benefit Canadians, okay? The first resiliency center, again, the business case is terrible. It's negative 189,000. You should get to page 18 on this feasibility study. It's a terrible business case. During a good day, there's not enough business to justify it, but during a bad day, how do you quantify the fact that people who are stuck because of roads are closed or people who, who are, it's dark, it's a dark and stormy night. Lytton is named after Sir Edward Bulward letter who started that phrase, it's a dark and stormy night. The lights will always be on at the Kanaka Bar must stop rest stop. This is the project that we're doing, and we're doing it at our speed and on our time and on our dime, because despite making overtures to Canada and BC and others, there's not a lot of interest in supporting projects that have a bad business case. And I'm, I, I have to laugh about that, everybody. The problem is it's not about the business case tomorrow. It's about making sure that Canadians have a life, air, water, food, shelter. You shelter in place until the extreme weather event has passed, and then you pull back out and you start rebuilding. So we're going to build the must stop rest stop. This is the temporary siting. We have commissioned because of the lit and emergency. There's no stores, there's no cafes. So we're working with a company and they're bringing in a temporary store and cafe and we're gonna put it here. So there's the old restaurant lands to the top, right? This is where we're gonna put a temporary store and cafe with parking. And again, so here again, if, we, if we're lucky, we'll be able to put batteries on this building. So if the grid goes down, you still have lights and communication at this location. What does it look like? Well, it looks like hell. It's a bunch of, I think that's a rectangle. But you know what? It's a temporary building. What the permanent solution looks like, of course, will be amazing. But at the same time, in an emergency, bring stuff like this to communities who are suffering. Where do you go after a hard day's work? Nowhere in Lytton. You've got this massive amount of people who are commuting up to Lilibet, 45 minutes away, on BC's second to worst road. It's an unsafe road, so people are going to Lilibet at this moment to access basic services. So I wanted to see this is coming. This is the final product. This is what we were, we're going to build. Over to the left is a store. On the, on the bottom is a convenience store. Uh, there's retail, and there's going to be eight shelter units. We, we believe that the cost for one bed is $50 for overnight stay, GST and PST included. And for two beds, it'll be $60 a night. You don't need to make a lot of money. You just need to provide services that are available because Kanaka Bar doesn't believe in, well, I guess we do. We, we have a basic concept. We need to be able to recover our capital and operating costs, but we don't need the profit. Profit is what motivated the Fraser County War of 1858, and profit is the pursuit of profit is what has caused the global existential crisis, and we haven't changed that yet. So Kanaka Bar is introducing to the world the concept that you can have a feature, just ignore the fact that it might not be profitable. Next, a proactive investment in housing. 24 new residential units are coming up. Um, Again, um, this took three years to get where it is. We broke ground on October 21st. We're gonna produce uh, housing for uh, at least a, a minimum of 80 people. Sorry, yeah, that's his phone is going. So Edmonton, Alberta is calling me that <laughs> smartphones distraction. So what we have here is the crossing place is affordable housing. And affordable housing is not social housing and it's not market housing. It's a place where maybe the one bedrooms with hydro included will be about $500 a month. Everybody's incomes are fairly static. We can't afford to live in Vancouver for a, a little place might be $1,800 for a bachelor suite, but you still have to pay your hydro. So affordable housing is different. And so we created a model that we're rolling out at Kanaka Bar called the TCP or the crossing place. 
where any person who applies, regardless of age, age or race, sort of stuff, you know, and I'll give an example. Many people live in abusive homes, but they don't have a place to go to. So if a young man or a woman is in an abusive home, by law, they can't rent their own place to stay. That's crazy. If you are 14 years of age and you want to move to Kanaka Bar and you're going to pay rent, put your name in. If we've got vacancy, we'll make it available for you. So you need to understand here is that some of the things that we've created, it, it doesn't make sense because it needs to be inclusive. All British Columbians and Canadians need to have access to affordable housing. So our model is scalable and replicable. And I'm hoping that Caroline and Chad and all the participants view this very closely. It's going to be built and it's going to be operational and everybody will benefit from this model. I did a video called the climate change wolves uh, a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was November 25th. And I want to just talk a little bit about these extreme weather events. An extreme weather event like the lit and heat or the atmospheric weather is not weather. We designed British Columbia over the course of the last 150 years and even nationally for weather events. Sometimes we get too much rain, sometimes we get too much cold, but you know what? Those are one in a hundred year events or one or 200 year events. But then what are we gonna do about the frequency duration intensity of extreme weather events? Everybody knows that we are now at the EW level. EW, extreme weather events. The risk is known, the probability is known and baby, British Columbia is living with consequences. So I'm just saying here, and I haven't followed the recent story about the, their tornadoes down in the United States, but I also know that people in Quebec will tell you about what happens with extreme cold. We even asked the Texans last year who dealt with this extreme cold. So these extreme weather events, and there's four of them, heat, rain, wind, and cold. How then do we build infrastructure and buildings that are resilient? that can handle these extreme weather events and bounce us back as soon as possible. Resiliency is the ability to handle the event and then come back online as soon as possible. So now let's look, 168 days, this bar is on the first page since June 30th, where in less than 20 minutes, air, water, food, shelter, energy, transportation, communications, and waste systems were lost, displacing over 1,200 people in 168 days. What have we managed to do since then? Last night, I got an email from the village of Lytton. Their DNC, their do not consume on their water system has now been lifted. That doesn't mean, they didn't say if it's boil advisory, but they managed in 167 days to get their water system back online. So what did we do for water? We already know that, that there is no shelter available for the 1200. We already know that food was, uh, all the stores and cafes were gone. So we knew that we were commuting to get our groceries. And then of course the roads were closed as a result. So I want you guys, all of you, if you haven't seen it, to have a look at the video life after 50 degrees Celsius. And so BBC was doing a series on extremely hot locations, you'll look, oh, Lytton is compared to Dubai. Lytton is compared to places in Africa. Lytton is compared. Lytton? Canada's Lytton? Because the temperature was recorded by Minister of Environment at 49.6. But our site-specific data showed that Kanakabar was already in excess of 50 degrees. And we all know that Kanakabar's temperatures is five degrees cooler than Lytton. Lytton had exceeded 55 degrees Celsius in the week leading up to the fire. Is your town ready for extreme heat? Now, as a result, and I want you guys to understand, look at that top left. If you haven't read it, please, please go out and download the November 30th letter. Kanaka Bar has set into motion an incredible opportunity. The material that is available to help us with heat, wind, cold, and what, wet, rain, exist. Just nobody's ever brought it together in one spot. So we gathered as a nation and as the evacuees on October 15th, we then gathered again on November 12th. And what we're doing here is saying, look, even though we're suffering, we can actually take what we're experiencing 
and give other people the information they need. Is there an affordable alternative to traditional bills? And the answer is absolutely. And so by engaging Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, BCIT and Okanagan College to take the leads, we're doing a desk exercise study and we're going to do a component testing of the top products in the world. And then we're gonna roll it out at Lytton. So these are their notes from November 12th. I believe the five pages of questions, comments and concerns by the initial people um, is there, read it down here. Because for the 61 participants today, do you wanna live in a house that will burn down? Do you wanna live in a house or run a business that will freeze? Do you want to live in a house or business? So when we look at infrastructure and buildings, that will blow away in the next wind event. You are Canadians. Read these documents. Watch the video. Because we're all Canadians and we all need to have knowledge, awareness. What can we do? Lytton is faced with a new build. But at the same time, the homes that survive can be rebuilt with resiliency in mind. The materials exist that can not fire resistant your home, fireproof your home. So this product does exist. Ask Australia, ask Mexico, ask California, ask uh, Europe and ask uh, Siberia. There is this incredible product out there. It's just not allowed in Canada yet. This is why it's so important that Canadians and our governments participate in this review. You don't have to pay for it. We're going to do it anyway. If you want to send me money, happy, right? But at the moment, I don't have time for conversation. We are doers here at Kanaka Bar. So we are going to deliver the information for Canadians. And we're going to deliver it before January 31st of 2022, because there's going to be a shotgun start on the project on April 2nd of 2022. So keep your eyes on Kanaka Bar's uh, events. So the TCP, this is Kanaka Bar, this is what we call Lower Kanaka. So the housing units are going over here. The proactive builds can go to the right and there's also expansion room. So Kanaka Bar has a limited land base, but we can do something. These projects can be completed in the next six months. We don't have the money yet, but you know what? Where there is a will, there's a way. We'll find the money, I know we will, because uh, we, I've got uh, friends in low places. Right. And they will talk to their deputy ministers who will talk to their ministers and say, you know what, we need a solution and we need action. I don't know who the minister of NRCAN is. I was able to speak with ministers Lametti, Hadju and Miller last week, as well as the prime minister. But they don't have a mandate letter until I get the mandate letters. I won't know. But I know people like Chad Nelson, know people. I know people like Dan know people. I know that Carolyn know people. Please share what Kanaka Bar is doing because we, we really need a win right now. This is what happened November 15th. This is 28 kilometers north of us. One rain event, one extreme weather rain event. So what we have though, some good news came out yesterday. They're forecasting opening Highway 1 to the north of Lytton to single lane traffic in January of 15th. If that's going to happen, fantastic. It's been 20, so sorry, my something's here, 29 days since November 15th. Remember now, in the opening slide, I showed it's been six, 169 days since the Litton fire. Now we got this. This is a concurrent event. We're suffering from both the heat event yet, and we're suffering now from the atmospheric event. How does the Littonites keep the stiff upper lip? Well, look at the tie. It's called the extreme, uh, it's called the, the flame of optimism. I wear a yellow tie because it reminds me is that if you, where there's a will, there's a way. Don't let, don't let uh, mother nature get you down. She's just sending you the warnings. She do things differently or face the consequences. This is Tank Hill. Fragility and dependency of BC was exposed. Fragility and dependency of Canada was exposed. We built a system that's not designed for extreme weather events. You should probably rebuild. Oh, proactive. We need to completely redo our builds. This is what I'm saying. This is four kilometers south. 
So Highway 1 was impacted in 27 locations. Four of them have events like this. Highway 8, 23 locations. They have no idea how to fix that. High, highway 5. You look at the list of uh, highways in BC. Our transportation ground to a halt. Now, even if you get the little bit, do they have milk? Do they have bread? Do they have essentials? It's happening because we're able to get a few roads open. So all of a sudden, remember that warning about if you're in reactive mode, climate change anxiety, I can tell you at this moment, at my community, everybody is hypersensitive. Wind blows, rain blows, snowing. Are we gonna lose power? Are we gonna be able to get to the stores? So we have increased climate anxiety and unfortunately, very short fuses. People are snappy all over here. 1,200 people on Facebook and or Twitter and or LinkedIn, snappy, 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 because they're not seeing the path forward. They're not seeing progress. So that's the extreme weather events. Hey, what is this? Are you saying that everything Kanaka Bar can do is both scalable and replicable? I have an idea. Why don't we do all this two kilometers south of the village of Lytton? And all it requires is Canada and BC and the regional district, the village of Lytton and the indigenous communities to work together to replicate Kanaka Bar resiliency initiatives all in 100 acres. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All it requires is to Chad to shake a few wallets. Uh, and uh, by the way, Chad, you're very courageous letting me speak today. Kanaka Bar can make this happen. We created a new entity called the Fraser Canyon Emergency Services Society who could develop this land for the benefit of all BC and Canada. It's, it's a unique new model, a permanent emergency operations center because of the frequency, duration, intensity of extreme weather events, you need to switch from response mode EOC and volunteers to permanently staffed EOCs, staff who are ready to go to Lilith and or Kamloops and or Vernon and our Kelowna. As soon as the event occurs, teams of trained professionals are there and they're bringing the, the temporary buildings and other things that come over. It took me two and a half days to put a new potable water system on here. I'm meeting here between 11.30 and 12 with the guy that's designing the system. We're meeting with a bunch of provincial representatives. Potable, portable water systems exist. So when you go down, your systems go down, you don't have to be without water. And I love this. I met this lady one time. I called her the lady with the smile. I said, hey, lady, you want to help me build the toilet? And she stopped. And uh, it turns out it was Christy Clark. And she said, what are you talking about? I want to change completely the environment in the economy of BC. And I need to put in a foundational building called the must stop rest stop. It looks suspiciously like a toilet. And she said, that's what I'm talking about. That's a vision because what Kanaka Bar is doing is producing jobs, taxes, and safety that is both sustainable and resilient. The loggers cannot log the forests. That means a lot of people going down. Mining can't occur during extreme weather events. So you're going to have a lot of Canadians out of work. Well, how do we transition them? What is this concept of just transition? We need to bring in manufacturing. We need to do all sorts of amazing things. So Kanaka Bar has a plan. We just don't have your resources yet, but we'll get to that. This is where it's at. So I wrote a letter to the province about three, four weeks ago saying we're all British Columbians. I've been working with Canada at the best of my ability. I mean, I have no idea. Um, my MP is following everything. His name is Brad Vies. Uh, my MLA, her name is Jackie Tigert. They're all following Kanaka Bar's story, but you've got uh, politicians and that are in opposition, but they can at least have the conversation with the leadership. Leadership is needed. I haven't added up Kanaka's asks. I haven't added up the roadmap to rebuild, but I know that um, to, to help the village of Lytton uh, bring back their vision, becoming a, a sustainable and resilient community. I got a quote for $850,000 that would help develop the roadmap for the two to four year rebuild. Kanaka Bar in the meantime, can roll out projects that support not just the village of Lytton, that inspire Canadians. We need to give people something to cheer for before the next extreme weather event kicks us all again right where it hurts. So 
by, by presenting as I've done today, I'm saying, look, you've got a small community in the middle of nowhere who's taking care of business. Uh, uh, basically, we reverse the adverse effects of colonization here at Kanaka Bar. We do it based on our needs. It's community driven. The projects that we're proposing here are all community driven. This is from the evacuees. These are people whose homes survived. The November 12th notes. This is from British Columbia. This is from Canadians. This isn't a top-down approach. This is a bottom-up approach. And Canada, help or not help. British Columbia, help or not help. Because we're going to do it anyway. Because we're the Kanaka Bar Indian Band. We broke dependency on Victoria and Ottawa. But for, for our governments and our corporations and our financial institutions, we're all going to benefit. So what I'm going to do is Kanaka Bar will cover all the costs of this. But if there's somebody who wants to be able to help out, whether it's a dollar, whether it's five bucks, we'll create a tracking table. So when the, the applied research study and testing is completed of a 160K, we will, as part of the report, saying, and the cost of this study was borne and shared by the following individuals. The system review and uh, report, right, whether it's uh, behind the meter readers, uh, brand new HRVs, all these sort of things, that's foresight. Foresight said that they would do a bit of a review. Then we take the research study and the systems review and build these projects. And we're assuming just four, happy to put an eight, right? So at 400, uh, assuming $400 a square foot, I have no idea. So we're gonna hire a general contractor to build four to eight new bills. And that person will track completely the cost because remember the number one question that Litton evacuees asked us, is this affordable? Then they need to know the true costs. As for the village of Litton and TNRD needs, I'll be meeting with Mayor Polderman uh, in about an hour. And we're gonna go up to the, the old mill site that I showed earlier. And we're gonna see um, where we're at with that. And so I know that he has brought in provincial guests and they're supposed to be flying in by helicopter and we'll see what kind of supports the province is prepared to, to offer. If not, P Chad and Dan will always be getting the updates. I guess this looks like my final slide. Let me just double check. Yeah. So here I am. People ask, how can Chief Patrick be the eternal flame of optimism when everybody's pissing on him? And it's, it's a good question. That's the tie, right? And the answer is, I have six kids and 16 grandchildren. And this is Atreus on the right. Atreus, uh, if you watch the video, was born in Abbotsford. This is my youngest daughter's first son. And everything I do is for my children and my grandchildren. That's why I get up in the morning. I don't have time for, yeah, I guess I have at least five minutes for downtime. Gee, I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I get off the, get over it. You got to go out and do stuff. We're all British Columbians. How many more warnings and vents do you need? We can rebuild British Columbia back new, and we can retrofit the systems, the infrastructure and buildings so that it's resilient. We're all Canadians. When I pitched to Canada, and I say pitch, it's an invitation to participate, but even if nobody participates, that list of people, we're still gonna produce the results. Trish Joseph introduced herself in the chat room. Um, you know what? We want professionalism and we want objectivity. We don't want salespeople. By bringing in our polytechnical institutions, we can have trust and credibility in the reports and studies that are coming. Let's give everyone to someone to cheer for. Thank you, everybody, for at least listening to me today. Kanaka Bar's resiliency plans are there for the world to see. And if Kanaka Bar can do it, so can you. Thank you. My wife challenges me. She says, do you know the difference between ignorance and apathy? And I said, uh, I can't answer that. And I think she was alluding to the fact is that there's an I don't know and I don't care approach. Man, a lot of people are talking about things we should be doing. Even COP26. I would challenge Dan and Chad to share Arnold Schwarzenegger's presentation where he told the world leaders, it's an eight minute video. And he told the world leaders, congratulations, you've just attended COP26. You're all leaving 
with your hearts open and your minds open, and you're going to fail in your commitments. And you're going to fail because you're either stupid, liars, or corrupt. And you need to have a set of balls. Now, I, I have been providing BC and Canada with a way forward for a significant period of time. The presentation is entitled, I Thought We Had More Time. The very first call I made was to Minister Lana Popham when the heat dome hit. I was aware that the field crops would fail due to extreme UV and heat, and I knew that the animals in the lower mainland. We didn't invest in protecting our infrastructure in buildings, including our animals. So if you know what the risk is, and you know that the probability is increasing, and you know that the consequences are going to be awful, then and make the proactive investments. There's still time. But we don't have time for committees. We don't have time for think tanks. That time has passed. You've had since 1988 to 2021 to set this stuff up, and you didn't. So get out of our way, because British Columbians, Canadians, we will start protecting our homes and our families from extreme weather events. We need information. We need critical information. We need professionalism, and we need objectivity. When our politicians get in play, regrettably, that can lessen credibility. Justin Trudeau knew what was coming. So did Minister Freeland. So, and I don't know all the ministers. Minister Wilkinson, um, he was Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. I warned him about the sockeye salmon collapse. Then he became the Minister of Environment. Is he the new Minister of NRCAN guy? Hi, brother. It's me. Six years I've been asking for your participation and your support. Six years you haven't replied to an email. Right? So when we look at this, if British Clemens and Canadians are challenging our government to break the status quo, you can give everybody hope, but you need to quit. Don't ask me to fill out a grant application. You have the ability to make strategic investments, like what I've proposed in my presentation. Because these projects, remember, there's something called the adoption curve. We threw that out years ago. Same as change management. All that stuff has long since gone at Kanaka Bar. We're in, we got one path forward, and that path forward is our children and grandchildren. So it's easy to say no to the status quo. Ask yourself and ask your MLA, your MP, why are we perpetuating the very same thing that's creating the end of life as we know it? Where is the courage to say no? In place, there should have been emergency operations centers, as I proposed. Instead, we set up stuff after the fact, and we staff it with volunteers. The thing is, after 169 days, the volunteers are burnt out. If you have trained professional staff year-round who, who understand the needs of people who are suffering from trauma, then you got layered trauma. So when people come in, hi, my name is a volunteer, right? 18 hours, seven days a week running these volunteer centers. Things are ugly out there. So we can't run an emergency response boat on volunteers. We have to build capacity. We need to get people into 24-7, 365 emergency response boat. Get retool people. By all means, go to school to become an accountant. By all means, go to school to become a welder. Or go to school and learn about emergency response mode management. How do we deal with a crisis in the first 24 hours, the first 48 hours? For Christ's sake, if people are suffering, communicate with them. We need cathartic moments. That's why the short fuses and, and the angry voices are there. It's because nobody's listening to the Merit 7,000. Nobody's listening to the Merit of the Litton 1,200. Just me. And I'm not trying to exaggerate. So the thing here is, when people are suffering, they need to have opportunities to gather. 
So on October 15th, Dan, did you know that we gathered at CNR? CNR voluntarily stopped the train and we gifted the engineers with gifts because they didn't cause the fire. Climate change and extreme weather events did. We're all Canadians. And the last words that were said on October 15th was, it was the actions of a few that is destroying the world for the many, and it is the act of a few that will save the world for the many. And approximately eight minutes ago, there were 61 people online. There's now 57. What will you do to save Canada for your children and grandchildren? It's about empowerment. Dan has the biggest tool available. He's got it in his right hand. Sir Edward Bulward Lytton said, the pencil is mightier than the sword or something like that. My hometown was named after that. Apparently, he was quite famous back in his day. He's just criticized today. The pen is mightier than the sword, right? It was a dark and stormy night. Stand up. Stand up, Canadians. Caroline, you need to do this. So, Caroline, comment dit on knife en français, s'il vous plaît? Knife? Oui. Couteau? Oui. And I told you I was known as the Couteau tribe. Absolutely. Our first contact was with the French. Not able to pronounce in the camp mode. They said, but they have 1,200, or they, there's 1,200 of them there, and 400 of them have knives. So I shall call them the people of the knife. So with contact came change, but what we've learned, we can unlearn with awareness. And that's why the national adaption strategy is so critical. We have to perpetuate awareness. We have to break the status quo. And you can only do that by doing things differently. And some of the videos that we've released, we've talked about keep the fossil fuels in the ground. But what are the oil and gas industry going to do? Build solar? Yes. Build new resilient homes and infrastructure? Yes. We can retool. We have the ability. What we've lacked is the leadership to say no. So, Dan, well, thank you very much for that question. Um, I hope that I answered it. Uh, 